On behalf of East Ayrshire Ledger, welcome to this Book Week Scotland event, kindly sponsored by our friends at Scottish Book Trust. It's not quite the Book Week Scotland event we normally have, and we're not all together in the Dick Institute, but I am absolutely delighted to be here in person at a safe social distance from Helen Fitzgerald, one of my favourite authors, and I know an author whose books fly off the shelves in East Ayrshire libraries. She's been a, a real firm favourite of readers here since she joined us for a Reader's Day some um, years ago now to talk about her best-selling novel, The Cry, something that I know that many of you have been watching on BBC television and perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about that a bit later on. Helen is a writer of suspense novels, of what she refers to as domestic noir, of thrillers and chillers that take us to unexpected places and invariably make us laugh along the way. Her latest novel, Ash Mountain, transports us to a small town in her native Australia, where we meet single mother Fran as she starts to reveal some of the dark secrets of the past. It's got a really great split timeline that really ramps up the tension, and it's got plenty of Helen's trademark humour, but it's also a devastating read with an absolute razor edge balance between love and tragedy. And I have to say, Helen, it had a really profound effect on me as a book. It was a real stay up all night to read and, you know, emotionally incredibly, incredibly powerful. Could we start by talking about genre a bit? Because obviously when we come to your books, they often look like traditional crime novels, but this maybe doesn't quite fit that pattern. No, I, I was actually started off, I mean, what happened was I had just finished work and I wrote Worst Case Scenario and I got a two book deal offer from Karen at a vendor and I really didn't want to write another book, I was exhausted, you know, um, but the two book deal, you know, I took it. So I thought, well, what can I write that's a bit different that will sort of you know, keep my interest up? And I'm a big lover of disaster stories, disaster movies. So I had been kind of thinking, well, I do an earthquake in Tuscany or do a flood in Scotland, you know, and, and what I wanted to do, I think because I, you know, I'm from Australia, I'm from the fire area um, in Victoria where, you know, the huge fires of 2009 happened. Um, yeah, I just wanted to write about the victims. I think because I feel like I have an insatiable um, thirst for knowing about victims you know, what were people doing when this? Where were they? What, what, you know, what decisions did they make? Did they turn out to feel themselves as heroic, or did they? You know, what sort of? And, and I just wanted to explore that. So it wasn't so much a fire, or even so much Australia that I wanted to to do. It was about victims of a, um, a weather event. You know, um, and I wanted and set out. The cry I think had just come out, had just been made, and I decided, right, this is also a very sad story. People die. I knew, didn't know who. I decided just before I wrote the fire scenes, I decided who was going to to die, which was well, I was actually the most uh, powerful writing experience. I was a little drunk, right? But it was the most <laughs> powerful writing experience when I got to three quarters of the way through this book, and I had to write those fire scenes, and I always trick myself when I write, but like I tell myself, I'm not going to decide what happens to Alistair in the cry until the very end, or that part of me kind of know is what I, I want to do, but I just want to make, you know, I didn't want to know who was going to die, and I wanted people to be upset. So I set out to make this as upsetting as I possibly could, and, and the love stories were part of that, a sort of mixture of tragedy and love, and um, all of those stories that are interrupted by a tragedy like that. Falling in love, people going about their lives, people moving house, going on holiday, dealing with you know what lives that are just completely interrupted. So it was completely different genre-wise. I can't help always having a little bit of mystery in there, but that's not because anyone's telling me to. I mean, Karen um, uh, Sullivan and Brenda, especially, is amazing. She will let me write anything except maybe the next thing I'm thinking about. <laughs> but no, she uh, she wants you to be. Brave, you know, so uh, I was able to go for a disaster story with, you know, one of the stories that's interrupted was a crime story, but there were a lot of other stories going on as well. And it is, I mean, the thing that was so powerful, I thought, for me is that we've got this awful world event that's quite familiar to us from the news, but there was something about reading the description of it 
that brought it home so incredibly powerfully. And I think it is partly because we have these characters and we've grown very, very fond, or I grew very, very fond of Fran and her family. But I'd love to hear more about how you managed to really put us in that place of the fire coming. Because there were, I mean, there were things that I just did not expect and how that plays out as a natural disaster. I think I think a lot of it was being, I mean, I grew up in Kilmore, which is an hour, a bit more than an hour north of uh, Melbourne, so, and it's bush territory. And from there on, it, it is really in a ways in the summer of a high risk of fire. And Kilmore, on my friend's farm, which is kind of like the Ryan farm in this, is actually the Kelly farm from Kathy Kelly. Um, the electrical fault started that fire. And then another, the weather and everything just, you know, came on top of it. To, and I was there following it. We just happened to be in Australia at the time with our family. And um, it was like 45 degrees. And, you know, if anyone's been to Dubai, and, you know, it's, that, it's like that all the time, you know, and it was just so, so hot. And we had been lying on the floor of my sister's house with all the curtains down and what we put covers over the veranda, cloth covers. We had every fan we could find sort of fanning with bowls of ice and we were just lying there absolutely boiling. And then in, in Melbourne there's always a period of heat like that, several periods in the summer and you just look forward to the cool change. It never lasts more than a few days, unlike other places in Australia. In Melbourne you know it's going to break. So you sit there just waiting for that smell, you know, and... The fires had been going and we could see the, you know, the smoke all across the bay towards Melbourne and all going up the other area where we grew up in Kilmore. The weather changed and we're like, oh, thank God. We went down to the beach um, and there's photos of us just like celebrating in the beach with the smoke over Melbourne. And what we didn't realise was that that wind change caused the deaths, the 183 people who died in like a couple of hours after that. And, and that fire was like the one I write, which is... Um, it just was bang like that. I think it like paradise and it just went through like a bulldozer. Two fires joined together, basically exploded in the air. The wind change meant that while they were going that sort of that way, they both joined together and went forth through all these little towns, Strathewan and Marysville. So, uh, you know, I just, and everyone you saw on the news in the days that followed talking about waiting for news, finding out where, you know, they'd gone off in a car, their wife had stayed. I was, I think every whole world, it's hard not to be obsessed when you're watching that kind of tragedy unfold. Um, but it did feel personal to me coming from there. Um, but I was obsessed. I watched, there's great documentaries made by the ABC, and I watched those like dozens of times, and I watched uh, interviews with farmers and people talking on, you know, just did a lot of research, basically talked to a lot of friends. So I knew what, felt, what people had said it felt like. And when I was, I'd actually finished the book when the fires came out in kind of Christmas, you didn't, I'm talking about it. <laughs> You're right, I like to do you to talk. Oh, I haven't actually, this is my first event for Ash Mountain, I haven't had a chance to talk about it. So, you know, it came out and I had all of those events lined up and, you know, we couldn't do any of them, so it's very exciting to actually talk about it. Um, Good. So what was I saying about um, the, the obsession and, and oh, talking to people, researching oh. it? Yeah, and as I said, I just, because after I, I still remember a lot of the faces that I was watching on the telly at the time, just feeling how familiar they were, they were like people I'd grown up with. And then, you know, it kind of stops and you move on to the next thing um, and you forget about them. And I just, yeah, I want to just, sort of just fill in lives a bit, you know, to make it, you know, this is a, these are people who have gone through this and who go through, you know, all over the world, different incidents, you know, like that where your world has just turned upside down. And of course, you know, it's climate change too must be yeah. fitting into it, but all well, the yeah. precautions people take that it's just not enough when something can happen there. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and I think the thing, I, was, I know what I was talking about actually, I had just sort of finished the first draft, I'd given it to my um, my publisher, bless her, she'd been waiting for 10 pages at a time, <laughs> and, um, and then the fires happened over a year. And what I was going to say was I was very closely following like Malakuta, you know, 4,000 people with horses and animals on the beach, just so otherworldly, just so hard to imagine. And people, the way they describe on Twitter and Instagram, you know, that I'd already read a lot of that from the previous fire, and I think that's where the detail came from sadly, you know, a lot of the way people die in my story is very familiar. Um, 
it's because that I, look, I looked at behavioural um, psychologists, five, five behaviourists, and where do people go, where, where, where do they mostly die, and you know, I did do a lot of gruesome research, I have to say, uh, because I wanted to get it right, because I didn't think if I'm writing a death, and I only really write one, it has to be, it has to be upsetting. And they feel it, otherwise, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it is gratuitous, so that's my kind of thing. And you do, and yeah, yeah, I can see there's an inevitability to having that death that wouldn't do justice to the situation. Yeah. I was waiting for the one we're talking about, I knew, I had written that scene at the start, and, and I knew that, that that was going to happen, but that was pretty much all. Um, but yeah, it's horrible. It doesn't sound very funny, funny does it? Was, I know, we'll get on to the funny, we'll get on to the funny stuff, there's a lot of it, but I just, while we're still on fires, I, I want to just draw attention to the cover image, um, and I wondered if you could explain that to us, because that was a thing that really startled me as well. I assumed that a cover designer had been... Isn't it amazing? It's a, uh, and this is another, this is what my publisher is like, because I was watching the Nalakuda fires and the fires over New Year, and... Um, the, uh, a photo came up, and it was this photo, and it was a guy, um, and then we thought this is going to be like a horror movie photo, a lot of people have been published in a newspaper because it was so striking, and I sent it to Karen, my publisher, and I said, I don't know if this is real or not, but um, wow, that would be an amazing cover, and anyway, she, <laughs> she got working away, she tracked down Rob, what's his last name, I really feel like I need to say it. Um, the guy who took the photo was from Port Arlington, is that right? Rob Dixon, Dixon. yeah, um, not Port Arlington, that's down there in my way, it was up in um, New South Wales, and yeah, he had taken the photo, picked up his children from school, come home, um, and his daughter is standing at the door, it looks like there are flames at the front, actually that's just the colour of the sky, so it's a little misleading, actually, she's not in danger, the wee girl's name is Ava. Anyway, Karen found Rob Dixon and he agreed to use, for us to use the, the cover, which is amazing. So when the town is not in um, grave danger, it's a really interesting kind of social dynamic in the town that you described very, very well. And I think in a way some of it might be familiar to, you know, those of us from small towns in Scotland, but this is quite specific in terms of how the the town set up, the school that's there. Could you talk us through some of that? Yes, yeah, like yeah, and I have to stress for legal reasons, this is not the town I grew up in, Ash Mountain, it's not Kilmore. I did make a lot of changes to it, so it wasn't Kilmore, but um, it does have a lot of the same dynamics and it is similar to where I grew up, which was a town that when, when I was little, about a thousand people, as I said, kind of commuting distance from Kilmore, from Melbourne, but it was mainly farmers. And it had a big boys, uh, Maris Brothers Catholic boarding school um, in it. It was the first Catholic church outside of Melbourne, so it became a real stronghold for Catholic communities. A huge number of Irish tenant farmers who, who moved there. So when I grew up, I grew up in a town with a very small population with about 900 boys in um, uniforms roaming around the street and um, S shaming girls all over the place. And I just, you know, it was only when I kind of started talking to my sister about the town and, you know, because I started writing this and I thought, oh, I'll make it a similar place to Kilmore. Then we started talking about it. We realised just how many predators there were around. Like, the thing about the school where I grew up, and it was only when I was writing this really that I Googled it and I thought, oh, no, I was right. There was, there was a sex abuse scandal going on there at the time with the Catholic Church, a couple of uh, priests and the... Um, one of the Morris brothers at least were charged and arrested and it's in the public domain, but I grew up hating borders because they were horrific to girls. They'd chase you, they'd assault people, they were mean and bullying and it was a really hostile environment for girls. And it was only when I started, sort of, like I said, researching the school and the town, I thought, oh, but the boys were you know, abandoned, left there by their families, they had a lot of expectations to be wealthy farmers and all great footballers and the essence of that's where that, it was a big sporting um, school, absolutely the worst scenario for, for a, a little girl growing up in a country town. So, but I realised that the borders have, you know, it also, there's reasons why they were like they were, you know, that a lot of them were being abused. And, um, and it's just kind of, as I went on and looked into this and talked to people from the town, I realised that the school then, I think, caused a bit of a chain migration of sex offenders to the area. It became this sort of place where 
I think like-minded people knew that it was okay to be into children, you know, um, for example, or to be abusive to women. So it was a hostile environment for a girl, and I have to say, and obviously for boys too. Um, so yeah, it was it was fascinating writing about it. I'm really nervous about it coming out in Australia because I've never kind of written about my town or like that. And, and I think there'll be an attitude of who are you to write about. You know, but it's you know it's the town I remember, and from Facebook, it's not really gotten much less redneck. <laughs> it's a great you know fiction tells the truth in different ways, yes. doesn't it? Yes. So we have these two stories. We've got the present day story that's leading up to the fire, um, but we have Fran's backstory too. And when you were talking there about school, a lot of the the things I don't want to go, don't want to give too much away, uh, but a lot of the things she's delving into are related to that and to the the crimes are really the crimes of the past, aren't they? And yeah, and for Fran, I think it's um, because I guess I was exploring tragedy and you know how we deal with it, and you know the, the fact with Fran is that she and the town over and over again since white invasion um, has gone through a series of tragedies. It's like one thing after another has really, you know, um, hit her and hit the town. It's about how you deal with that. And I think that it was funny, I was kind of like, what's, you know, writing about something like this, especially when an event like the fire happened in the middle of it, it's kind of, people will be, and I, and I am sort of like, is it relevant? How is it relevant? But the book was much more about community and about how a town like that actually, you know, the, the pain that you feel from an event like the school or an event like the fire is very intense in a small town. You, you know everyone, you feel their pain, you feel their tragedy, you go to their funerals. So, because uh, I sort of started off wondering, is it just my town? You know, because everywhere I looked when I was doing Google, I was going around like that's where she fell off the horse and died. That's where the baby drowned in the pool. That's where such and such got sexually assaulted. You know, I'm like, this is what my memories of the town are, just tragedy after tragedy. Um, I don't know what I'm saying all of that, but... <laughs> yeah, so the, Fran is kind of, you know, I guess um, she's a typical small town girl. She's tough. You know, she gets up and just gets on with it again. And, uh, and I guess that's what this book was. She's incredibly tough. Um, and as I said, incredibly likeable. And incredibly funny and that is something that really runs through your work um, you know I don't even quite want to say it's it's black humor I mean it's gallows humor often yeah. and you seem to be really attracted to that especially if you're your female characters and their kind of coping mechanisms yeah I think that's Australian actually more and more I, I'm thinking about it Aussies don't find it or then I go on about comedy in my book so, you know, it's, it's, uh, Australians are like that. But also Glaswegians are too, a bit. So the gallows humour from coming from social work, you know, and working in such, um, you know, with such difficult situations all the time. I mean, the humour got us through. Maybe it's something about being a little bit of an outpost and feeling a little, the country is being a little oppressed, that dark humour sort of comes through. Uh, well, I don't find it, I find it odd when a book doesn't have humour in it because I don't, know anyone myself who doesn't come out with something that might make you chuckle a bit and you're not always writing about the crime you're not always writing about the badness the bad bit the fire when that happened only took 15 minutes you know before that there's 20 years of potential humor and for me i i wanted to like the characters i always want to feel i like the main character in particular so i always can write a funny character because I wouldn't choose a friend either who wasn't <laughs> or even a dinner party guest who <laughs> wasn't a little bit funny you know so I guess it's just to me it comes very naturally, it's just, it shouldn't be that way. Could we talk a little bit just on that note about your, your previous novel, Worst Case Scenario, um, where you seem to, I mean really I think you use some of your experiences working um, in criminal justice social work um, for your character there, Mary, who is a um, woman on the, the verge of a nervous <laughs> breakdown, I think we can say, you know, going from yeah. going for de from devastating natural disaster to more human disasters of wife murdering, paedophilia, all the things that she has to deal with every day. Um, she's another fantastic character, but I'm so interested in how you must have used stories that you've heard and your experiences to invest that novel. Well, yeah, because I mean, I've been a criminal justice social worker since 1994, you know, on and off. I've kind of tried always to work as little as I can. <laughs> and I've you know, never 
Um, yeah, I've never worked full time for any long period of time, but I've worked on and off in social work for a long time. And I think the I could never write that job fully until I knew I was leaving because I always felt like I would come back. This time I felt like I wasn't, uh, not because I've got enough money or anything like that, but I just I don't want to do that job again. If I do a job or something, it's easier. And I wanted to show what the job is like because for a long time people have asked me, I don't understand exactly what you do. What does it mean when you're supervising someone on parole or a life license? You know, what does that mean? Walking around after them or, you know. So I wanted to show what it means and how complex it is because I think it's a really hard job and a hard balance to get right when you're you're supposed to be, you could you could have a relationship with a, with a, someone for, for life. If they're on a life license, it could be for the rest of your life that you, you know this person. So how do you get that balance between the control that you have and you can breach somebody, you know, it's um, there's a lot of power in putting conditions on your parole license and I know it's the parole board who make those decisions, but it's someone like Mary who enforces them. And it's tricky, it's tricky telling someone that they can't drink or that they can't, you know, and, so I wanted to show the job and I felt that when I left, I was like, okay, because I've always been, there's always been social work in almost every single one of my books, but I've always held back from what, what I think, what I was exploring in this is how hard it is for someone. That, and if something happens like Mary's unprecedented hormonal disaster, um, then you can't do it. I don't think, I couldn't do it. It was like one day I realised, oh, my, I'm a bit out of control mood-wise because of um, menopause. That I'm not going to be able to do my job. I'm not going to be able to listen to that guy anymore without wanting to punch him, without actually punching him in the face. You know, I was losing, and so it's just, and it's something about taking, um, being honest about that. Because I think in police work and social work and jobs like that, you can really just take it and take it and take it. And the number of my friends I know who retire and then die almost immediately. You know, get really sick in their retirement because, or go off, well, end up going off long term sick. It's a job that's really hard. I just wish it could be that everyone was able, like I've been, to sort of have five years and then off. And then, because actually, I've, my best years in social work are always when I go back and that first year I'm full of energy and full of, you know, yeah, I can make a difference. You know? And after that, you get exhausted and bogged down. So, and I mean, worst case scenario is it is a hilarious book. I mean, the, the dark humor is incredibly dark and just incredibly, incredibly funny um, at points. But it conveys the it seems really to convey the realities of that job, which I think from the outside we're not aware of. As you say, I don't think I had a sense of what that sort of supervision of somebody might right. might entail, you know, and as well as the, the sort of bureaucratic pressures of everything. Yeah. Everything's stretched, everything's being cut, you know. Yeah. You've still got people, you know, who can't, you know, can't take their lunch and everyone's have to eat it as they go and visit somebody, you yeah. know, sort of obnoxious in their home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it is a really tough job. And I think when I went back last time, you know, every time it's sort of because it was also we were warriors, you know, in the eighties and nineties I felt like social work and the cost and everything was very um I get, you know, we all felt like, you know, we were going to change things and it was about fighting poverty. It wasn't about just about putting fires out, you know. And as time goes on and the last time I went back to social work, you know, and every council worker who's read that book, I mean, what they really relate to is the flexi time scenes and the fact that every little penny is pinched from you, you know, like, and also making life harder for clients, like trying to get a food voucher or a bus ticket refund or something. It felt like you had to be humiliated for a certain amount of time before you get any help anymore. Um, and the social workers, you know, weren't able to provide any kind of fact practical help anymore. Um, and it's actually the practical things like fixing someone's dripping tap or getting someone to fix it that makes the relationship work. You know, they can actually, you know, somebody can learn to trust you as much as they can. Um, yeah. It's a fascinating job. I miss it. I miss, you know, the buzz I used to get meeting someone in prison for the first time and just they like, tell you their story. Well, yeah, I really miss that. And there's no demonising of these people either, I think, you know, where, you know, I describe them as obnoxious there and that's, you know, the things they have done are often dreadful, but I think, you know, across your novels that I've read, you're interested in the social circumstances that create those yeah. possibilities, I well, think. Well, yeah, because we were doing, like, increasingly more and more domestic violence cases, you know, probation and parole, 
coming through the courts. And you know, before I left work, we were doing sort of one-on-one -on -one domestic. I can't remember what it was called. Some jargony social work thing, but you know, working about relationships, and, we, and I was like working solely with men. And a lot of what I wanted to sort of explore, and a lot of the time, I'm always questioning myself when I'm writing. Like, what do I actually think about this? You know, um, that I didn't feel like I ever put much effort really in. I, I made a lot of assumptions about men. I've always felt like domestic violence issues is a huge uh, statistical truth that it's women who are, you know, and, and in lockdown, it was 11. Deaths, how many were women? So I always thought, where were the statistics coming from? You need to, to double check, it's definitely gender issues. But I did feel like I didn't have many places to send men. Like, I'm like, well, how can I help you with you know, custody issues? With um, what, what a lot of them go through is said to be the same pattern, you know, alcohol, whatever, violence, breakup, and then harassment, and you know, the guy getting angrier and angrier. And Woman becoming more and more frightened, and it's about dealing with every aspect, isn't it? I can't remember what I was saying about that. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to question. I think in worst case scenario with Liam was that she does kind of miss things, doesn't she? You know, and I and I understand. I still feel like, oh yeah, yeah, that could have been me um, because she has prejudices of her own. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, it's, I get the sense that you're often working through things, and you've been thinking about. Um, the exit now, and themes that actually come up here in Ash Mountain um, with Fran's family and um, with her father, who she's a, a carer for. Um, there seem to be lots of things that are sort of questions that we have about life and death that you you often really engage with very strongly and seem to work through and pick up in different novels. Is that? I think that's, that's probably thing. exactly what I do. You know, and if I run out of problems in my own life, I'm unlikely to write. You know, as so I'm always kind of working through. Like in the cry, you know, remembering back to someone who's very manipulative, and you know, how did that feel? And the actual behaviours that were very subtle, that you know, and how could I write about those? Yeah, I'm always, I am always doing that. I think just to make life hard for myself, and that's why I need a break in between books. I get really tired of analysing my thinking. <laughs> you know, but I think you can, you know, you can feel it. Certainly, you know, when I read this book, I, I said how much it affected me. You can feel that emotional energy that must be being poured into it. It's not. It's not a sort of nine to five job, right? By you know, right by numbers. So it really doesn't. Yeah, because it's really different from these two books. This and um, worst case scenario were like that. It was really different writing experience. Like I don't know whether it's because I I can't get television out of my mind now. So I had every scene was like I was directing it with you know every bit of furniture in the room. You know to. I was seeing it completely and writing it in my head completely before I would even um, go, go to the computer and put it down. So, but, and that, yeah, the same with Ash Mountain. I wrote it scene by scene, spending huge amounts of time and notes and, in my head, which I've never really done before. And then, not until it was perfect, I was like, then she goes there, then she goes there, then she does that. Would I sit down and write it? You know, in like 10 minutes. So. It was a different writing experience. Yeah, different sort of process. I know that one of the questions that's come up in advance of this session is about television, about the crime, um, finding its its way to our screens. Uh, were you happy with oh it? Oh my god, was I happy? So yeah, I mean, Claire Mundell, the synchronicity film, she um, actually optioned Dead Lovely, my very first book, and then she optioned My Last, uh, my last Confession and then Devil's Staircase. So we're talking fifteen. Years of us trying to get something. It wasn't. It, it was a surprise, but it wasn't because a year before, earlier it had sort of been got the stamp from the head of drama, and then the head of drama left, and so we had a year of it going back to some desk. Which is, you know, there's always these devastating times in development of TV and film where you think you're so close, and then prompt something. It's a bit like you know, the election results at the moment. <laughs> we'll have a bit sleeping for two days. Um, yeah, so Claire Mundell had been trying to get something off the ground for ages. A year had gone by, we thought it was over. And I remember I'd go to bed every night, I'd, I'd have a little fantasy to help me sleep, it's clear, I think. Because I was in the meantime married, basically, in, in worst case scenario, I was going off the edge at work. It was just a timing thing, you know, and she rang, she rang that the day that I'd gone off sick a few days and said, I can't, you know, I'm worried I'm going to punch someone. And I didn't say that to my boss. <laughs> <laughs> now she knows. Um, and Claire rang that night and said, guess what? 
it's being commissioned. And I rang my boss and said, Bob, oh, thank you. Sorry, but I'm going to go. So getting it made was incredible. But then it's like the worry about, am I going to hate this? Because I know a lot of writers who do. Yeah. Not, you know, it's really hard to get it right. And I had done things in the book which, you know, I was, I'm always experimenting. So I was experimenting with just like, how about having a mystery where I just tell you <laughs> exactly what's happened. And my worry was always that they're not going to do that, they're going to hold off, it's going to become a missing baby story. But when I said, and I did do that, you know, I just actually knew that that would happen for at least a couple of the four episodes. Yeah. But everything else, and also I thought, how are they going to do the humour? Because people have always, it's all it's hard. Um, and in the cry, the only humour really is coming from Alexandra, the ex-wife. And so it depended on how much time she got, but she, she didn't get as much. But I think they did a brilliant job. I loved it. I loved it. I think Claire did an amazing job. Australia looked beautiful. Performances were just great. Cried my eyes out at the end. And it's funny because it's like the ending is different and everyone's like, you know, and a lot of that is different, but I didn't feel like it was different. The ending, feeling what I wanted her to be feeling is all that matters. I could have written it a million different ways too. So I'm not precious about mm -hmm. things like that as long as I felt like it emotionally was anywhere it ended. And it did. So, I mean, Bravo, I think they did amazing. And Claire and I are working on several things together still. So, oh, brilliant. Yeah. So that's good. Oh, this. Really? I was going to ask because, of course, yeah. you know, is it announced yet? There's always like rules about what you're allowed to say. Okay. Yeah, that's been announced. So there's actually opened up a um, synchronous in Australia and um, the work on this, which is good. For a film? Or TV. A TV? Yeah. yeah. I, I think, I don't know. I'm now like over to you. I don't mm -hmm. really want to write scripts or anything. I was going to give it a go with this one, but I started writing the treatment before the book. Actually, that was the other thing about this, because I told Claire about the idea accidentally, and she said, oh, I'm not optioned that, and she optioned it before I'd written the book. <laughs> it was, like, terrifying. So I started trying to write it as a treatment for TV, and it's probably why well, it's quite different, yeah, actually. But I abandoned all of that and didn't use most of what I'd done, and then said to Claire, I, I don't want to do that, I just want to write it as prose. I seem to be losing something by trying to write it treatment style. But it's interesting to hear about that process when you were talking about almost, you know, imagining it visually and sort of positioning people and scenes, um, you know, is that being a different way of writing? Because I know that, you know, if, if you don't mind me saying that you're married to a screenwriter yeah. and screenwriting is something that you've done. Yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting to hear that it seems that that process has carried over yeah, a bit yeah, more to these recent that has, and that Probably because of the crime, because I thought it did excite me so much. And I have to say it was the highlight of my career, that show, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, I still feel overwhelmed when I think about it. That's probably what my dream has been to, to get a good TV or movie made. And yeah, living with a screenwriter is great because he's always worked that way. He's always walking around the house. You know, you can see that he's yeah. And it's that, and then, and then, and then. I think I was just getting so specific and detailed, which I hadn't been before. Like really, really detailed and realizing, oh yeah, this. My mum's always said that. Get into detail. But she's right. <laughs> and not in a boring way, just know, just know your character. So these two characters, I feel like, yeah, I know. Yeah, definitely. And it's not, I mean, it isn't just friends, everybody around her, as you say, the town is a character in itself, the families, the history that these families have independently are together. Um, and that you mentioned a while ago, um, white invasion, you know, one of the tensions is that with, you know, who appears or is indigenous. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a particularly sort of humor, humorous, unpolitically correct competition for the, the best knitted cap made by that's right, made by a baby person in the time. <laughs> the best knitted cap. Yeah, I think actually I felt a bit bad because after the fires there were communities who were doing lovely knitted chalks, chickens, well, chalks. Um, so I kind of used that as a, as a cat because cats are feral in Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not really allowed. So, yeah, another invasion. But I mean, the, yeah, the, the Indigenous topic, I, I started writing Ash Mountain and I thought there was no one Indigenous in our town like, because after white people came, it was either murdered, stolen or pushed out of the town. So I never, ever saw anyone who was Indigenous growing up. And so I was going to leave it like that because I thought it's reflective of the town. 
But then I thought, no, it's, it's an opportunity, especially if it, you no, know, it has to have an Indigenous story, especially originally it was called Australia Day and the fire was going to be on, it is on Australia Day. Um, you can't leave Indigenous history and characters out of the story. So it was a challenge and it was um, great to write those characters. Yeah, it's another thing that I thought works really well just in terms of the, the novel being about so many different things mm -hmm. at once. So you said that you you can't write all the time. You're not writing every day. What sort of pattern does it fall? Uh, so I, think, yeah, I, think, I think it's probably there even if I have a deadline. I do try to force myself to... to I try not to think about word count anymore. I've got a lot of friends who do... do um, races, you know, races to 100. Uh, whenever I've done that, it's been really bad, and I've spent so much time having to undo things. So um, my my is more of a yearly pattern. And again, because I was working for a while, I, you know, part time, I would it change. It has changed. I think my, I always change up my routine. But at the, mo at the moment, and for a while, there is a yearly pattern that I tend to write in winter because I hate the <laughs> and it's, it gets me through, it makes me feel euphoric when, like, you know, when you get into it. So I tend to write sort of November, December, like I should be writing soon, a few minutes, should get started. Um, yeah, and in the summer it's usually events and things and um, so, yeah, but day-to-day -day pattern, no, no routine, very badly organised. <laughs> I need to get, get my act together. I think that that would probably be a delight for um, writers watching this to hear that um, sometimes the yes yeah, sometimes it's not quite the the discipline pattern all the time but then when it is clearly yeah. it is yeah when I get I think the thing is I have a real reluctance to start because once I've started that's it that's me for three months so it's out, I'm out of action my bills will get paid I'm not going to be feeding anyone so I don't want to do it yet and my daughter's just you know we've had the whole lockdown thing I know I'm about to start but it's just almost like starting a race and you know you're not going to to stop so yes yeah, soon but not yet. So I don't know how you feel I, I wonder if for some writers, was lockdown a little bit easier because you're used to sequestering yourself away for these months and being in your own, yeah. you know, in your own head, or was it just? Well, I, we we had a lovely time in lockdown. I mean, the, I'm starting to realise now that I need those events for socialising. That you know, like I've been, we writers, I think, spend most of our time in the attic and then come out for these intense socialising experiences, which work, but mostly. It's fun, you know, talking to other writers and meeting people and having a drink and it's a weekend away. So during the summer, I, you know, I usually have those things a lot and none of that happened. Um, and instead of that, both kids or adults, we were just about to be empty nesters. We were looking at downsizing because we didn't need a garden. <laughs> Who needs a garden? We want to be around lots of people and cafes and bars. So we were just about to move when this happened. The kids came home and we became instead like really really kind of contented, mindful gardening people. You know, I actually feel like I've been content for the first time in my life. So <laughs> I'm both delighted and, and horrified because I'm really worried that the discontent is what makes the books. So that, that, yeah, yeah, that's why I'm not writing, maybe. I need to be unhappier. <laughs> I, don't, um, I don't expect you're suddenly going to write a cosy mystery for your next book, but do you have a sense of what it is? Um, I've got kind of two things that are up on. I've got, I love flip chart paper. I think. Um, so I've got flip chart paper all over my room. One of them, I'm working with my husband on a creature horror about, oh, nice. uh, about a couple um, and a big hairy spider the size of a car. So that's a TV idea. It's, um, and we love it. And so I've planned all of that out. It's just sort of get, getting close. I just need to sit down and do a kind of seven page outline for TV or something like that. And I've um, been working on another one called The Sundowner. Um, it's one of those ones I get more I think about. It, I'm just like, so if it, you know, like, does the world need that story? <laughs> it's like, have I written that before? So I'm not sure about that one yet. I have done quite a lot of work on it. I've gone off it. What's it like collaborating with someone, especially someone so close oh, to you? Well, this is only this is our first attempt, really, and we thought we're well, so just great at horror, and um, we but getting that sort of prose treat. We, it's, we're a good team, and we feel like we're a good team now for the first time. But we're writing it away, and it's like the scary spider, and the, it's basically us when we were sort of deciding whether we we're going to move to Australia or we're set up set in Australia. And we've got like in this story, there's a four year old. Um, so it was going really well. We've been having brilliant 
ideas and um, but then suddenly surges like okay and I realized when I went over the note that, that a red-headed young journalist has appeared in the story and I, I get consumed to become the spider you know and he's, <laughs> I'm like, no, that's not happening. That, that was the preview, yeah. isn't it? It's funny, I think because we are talking about marriage, and so actually it's going to be throwing up a lot of things about our marriage, and, and unless it does that to me, it might be a good story. You know, so we're actually exploring um, how couples make decisions, and also big hairy spiders. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit weird, but yeah, we like that. Um, a couple of other questions came into us um, from from Twitter, Helen. I think most people were really, really happy with the, the cry and really wanted to know about that. But there's a couple about writing as well, um, and in terms of where you write, do you work at home? Uh, yeah, and I, we've got an office with two big desks set, uh, you know, facing each other under the window. When I look around the house, it's almost at the moment, that's, what, that's in the big front room. We change our rooms around all the time. I do. I'm a bit nuts like that. But if you're not going to have a holiday or move, then move some furniture around. And when I look around the house, I realise I've written a book pretty much in every room. So it's been, you know, that one's where I wrote The Cry, that's where I wrote this, that, and the other. So um, I don't have a particular spot. And either does my husband. He's quite often sitting on the couch under the window really not looking like he's working, <laughs> but he is, he's riding River City, <laughs> So the thing about it is you can go anywhere. Um, so no, I don't have, I used to ride a lot in cafes and I don't anymore, um, obviously, but even before coronavirus I, I didn't do that anymore. I just realised I didn't get very much done. So no, I don't really have a spot. It's um, quite adaptable. Yeah. For, yeah. I do like to be at, you know, when I do the writing bit, sitting down at a desk where Serge can be, you know, sitting on a couch with things on his lap. I know I have to be upright and um, stiff. <laughs> <laughs> There's another charming question here. I don't know where this is coming from. What's your favourite literary bear? Oh, uh, do you know that's really... I don't know, Winnie the Pooh, I suppose. Literary bear. It's funny because my um, husband is currently writing a thing called We Paws about a bear community up in the Caledonian forest. He's been drawing these beautiful bear pictures and trying to get his bear, you know, the way that he looks, uh, that they are lovable. Yeah, that is an interesting question. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not a great lover of Winnie the Pooh. I was never, like, a massive, massive fan. But my son has not read Winnie the Pooh. What else do you read? Is, it, is crime your preferred genre for reading? Um, I haven't been reading much at all lately. I've just been watching and podcasts and at the start of the lockdown I got really got into Audible. I don't know why, I just haven't been able to concentrate on books. But generally I like yeah, I like a good thriller. Um, but at the moment it's mostly true crime podcasts that I've been watching. I've been through a really shameful period of watching no, it's not shameful reality telly, married in first night of Australia, seven years switch, which I, I mean it's genius to watch when you think about these manipulative producers and what they're doing to people. It's like terrible. Yeah. But you can't help yourself watching. <laughs> um, I, do, I do absolutely agree. I think at the beginning of lockdown, I was obsessed with Audible. There was something about being read to that was very soothing and yeah. kind of worked with the, the concentration. Yeah. Definitely. And it's, you don't have to be sitting down. I think it's at the moment it's a bit fidgety and um, yeah, anything that makes you sit, sit still. <laughs> before we before we round off our event, I wonder if you'd like to read us an extract from Ash Mountain for people who haven't read it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this is the third page. Um, Fran has woken up at three in the afternoon to the bushfire and has run off and taken um, refuge in the monument, which is uh, we used to have in the town of Kilmore, which is a lookout tower for the old jail. Um, and it's like a big tall, it's like a Wallace monument actually with a sort of winding staircase in the middle. So she's been hiding in there while the fire has gone over and it's just, the noise has just stopped. The sudden still was confusing. She was inside a stone tower, so perhaps that why that, that's why there wasn't a, a breath of wind, no bird chirping, no town siren. All she could hear was her breathing. It was dusk dark inside. Weak waves of blood orange light softening the 20 feet above and 20 feet below the curved step. Perhaps it had passed. Perhaps the thick drops of the cool change had brought boys and girls outside into gardens to rejoice in the wet. It was too still. 
Thunder always accompanied the ecstasy of the cool change. Maybe she was dead and this was Hades. Growing up, she'd often wondered that. Or the wall of grey was a spaceship after all and she was now inside it. Ram was, usual, was totally willing to go with the alien hypothesis, but then the silence stopped. A noise. What was that noise? Several jet engines seemed to be heading towards her. The rumbling. She looked at her watch, 3.37 p.m. By 3.52, it should get quiet and be safe to step outside. She covered her ears and counted sheep, and when they started burning in her mind, she counted spoons. And when they melted in her mind, she counted, she would count thornies. That's what she, that's what, Veronica, beautiful body, burning body. Two minutes in, 13 to go, she inhaled hot dirt and resolved, my honey. Fran pulled the beanie over her head and the blanket from her backpack over her body. She pressed her face to the ground and for the next 13 minutes trembled no more than the 70-foot rock in which she was encased. Sorry, that was just before the fire, as the fire was going over. Which, um, again, was like the um, Malakuta we were talking about before. I had written that, but then like, when I was following Twitter on the night of those big fires and there was this guy called Brendan in Malakuta and he seemed to be the only guy who had any reception and he was getting information out to everyone. It was incredible to watch, to listen to. But also he was describing the noises and the sounds and you know, and so you knew that when, when it goes dark and when it goes quiet, that it's a really scary time. You know, so there's a bright red and then there's a darkness and then the, the fire sucks the air and all burns, all the noise goes away, it seems really quiet, and he was saying it's really quiet. And even he was kind of fooled, he was expecting it, but he was kind of fooled by that, by that moment of peace, and then pump, and then it came through. Luckily it wasn't so bad in Malakuta, and everybody, everybody was safe there, amazingly. I think that would happen, but anyway. <laughs> this is a, a very technical question I just have to ask, actually. So the sort of fire forms, is that a real thing? You mentioned the bunker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of people, after the 2009 fires, built bunkers. There's a lot of concerns with them because ones that aren't safer, you know, and that's why Mike, he says, you're not got a bunker, have you? There are ones, and people do have them, and a lot of people still build their own, and some of them certainly saved lives. But the thing about bunkers is the air supply and and the materials obviously to withhold the heat, but you have to go somewhere where there's no need for any outside oxygen and it runs out. So those kind of dilemmas where people had a bunker but they could only fit four people in for an hour, neighbours are knocking on your door. I mean, all these sorts of moral dilemmas come, you know, come at you when there's a disaster like that. The nice thing was in the research that I did, I, and a lot of people said this who study it, is that most people become heroes, and, and that's a nice thing to know. And I think that in the coronavirus, and I think we've found that too, don't we? Most people are, you know, the, the default is kindness and helping, at least at the time of the emergency <laughs> afterwards, when everything becomes, you know. But yeah, that was nice and heartening, actually. And in mine, most people, they, I think their actions, I feel like they, they've seen real and they were all pretty selfless, really. That seems like a really good place to, to finish thinking about heroism and good coming out of really the, the worst and most frightening yeah. circumstances. Um, I highly recommend Ash Mountain for people looking for a gripping read to help them as we perhaps go into another lockdown. It's been such a pleasure to speak to you today, Helen, and it's lovely to be in a library again and out and about um, and I also want to say a very warm thank you on behalf of readers to East Dear Leisure and East Dear Shore Libraries particularly who have been keeping people supplied with lockdown reads via ebooks and now through safely quarantined um, hygienic borrowing books so I know that that's very very much appreciated. Thanks again to Book and Scotland and Scottish Book Trust but most of all to Helen Fitzgerald. And thank you, thanks Sally. Thank mm -hmm. you.